Holy Gospel according to John, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you, so that my love, my joy, rather, said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because servants do not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that my father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. For our children's message this morning, got a couple things I want to show you all. There you are. How are you this morning? How are you this morning? I can actually see you in person. It's really fun. So I have three items up here. I have these gloves. Okay, I have this mask, all right, and I have this cookie sheet. So what can these possibly have in common? What do you think all these have in common? Yeah? That they're not alike. The one thing that these things have in common is they're not alike. I love your thinking. So reasonable. Not alive. Oh my goodness, that's even better. You are absolutely right on both accounts. These things are not alive. Very good. Um, well, try this one. All these items can and do, I guess that's not. There we go. All these things can show other people that we love them, right? So if I put these gloves on and go help my wife out in the garden, because she likes to have a garden, either flowers and or vegetables, and when I go out to help her, because that's not really my thing, but it's her thing, when I put these gloves on and help her, that's showing her that I love her. When we wear these masks, we are showing each other that we love one another, that we care for each other's health, and we want to keep everybody healthy. That's another way. And who doesn't like a good cookie every once in a while? When we bake cookies and share them with other people, that's showing them how we love. Jesus is asking us to abide in his love by showing other people love. And that's what we need to do. Any way we can find to do that. So let us pray. Good God, you are awesome and we love you. We thank you for the gift of love that we can share with others. Help us at all times and in all places. Love as you love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you very much. We'll put this back over here. Grace, mercy, and peace from our Creator and our Lord Jesus Christ to you this morning. Amen. What an incredible opening statement. This morning we hear Jesus said, as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Of course, this is a continuation of what we heard last week of last week's gospel, there's, there's nothing, nothing skipped in between. Yet today we begin hearing about love, commitments, and joy, commandments, and joy. Now, take a moment 
recall a time in your life you found joy, uh, not happiness. I hope that you have many recollection, 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 rec, recollections of happiness, but try to remember a time your joy was complete. You felt time pause or actually hover around that moment. It's a moment that is fixed in your memory, and you can bring it up with little or no effort. Now, for myself, those moments usually coincide with family and friends. Our daughters used to take horseback riding lessons, and it was joyful, joyfully breathtaking to see them, this little person on top of this huge horse, commanding it to tell it where to go. Our son, Connor, has always been a performer, and seeing him on stage fills my soul with joy. Witnessing your children grow and learn in school and life is one of the most joyful events I can remember. Now, supporting friends also. We're, we're supporting some friends with infertility by sharing our challenges with the same issue. And, and it made it especially joy when they finally welcomed the birth of their new daughter. And a joyful surprise when they welcomed their second. But there are also times when joy appears in the unexpected. During seminary, there were several um, foreign exchange students. And one of them approached me to tell me about the opportunity to sponsor a high school student back in, in his country. A small amount of money would actually cover his whole high school career. The money was tight back then. But during those years of seminary, we found a way to help. And it was a joyful memory that we were able to help someone. That we wouldn't even meet or ever be able to know. Or maybe your story that brings joy is something that you just witnessed on TV or the news. In Charleston, South Carolina, love is stronger than hate were words uttered by Chris Singleton after losing his mom, Sharonda Coleman Singleton, during the Charleston church shooting in June 2015. He believes God was speaking through him during that time to show the power of forgiveness despite tragedy and the ultimate act of hatred. He says, I thought there was no way I could forgive my mother's killer. I didn't even know why she was murdered at the time, didn't know who did it, didn't know anything, but I said, we already forgive him. And to me, I think that is a statement of God working through me and I know now, why? Because of how powerful forgiveness is. Jesus is telling the disciples about love, commandments, and joy in the last few hours that he spent with them. Jesus has loved them just as God has loved them. And he wants them to abide in his love. So he asks them to keep his commandments, to love one another so that Jesus' joy may be in them and their joy will be complete. He goes on to say that no one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Jesus is defining who is performing that greatest love. Jesus is the one with the greatest love. He is not expecting anyone else to lay down their life and become martyrs, though some people have. But Jesus laid down his life for us and chose to do so. He is the one true vine connecting us to God. And in doing so, our salvation is assured through him. Our salvation is complete. There is nothing we can do or attempt to do to gain our salvation. It is finished. We have it. That is the grace that we receive through God and the greatest love. And as we live into that grace... Jesus is asking us to abide in him, to keep his commandments, and love one another. This is where we find complete joy. 
Last week, we heard about the grace of God through Jesus, the true vine. This week, we hear about the, following the commandments, the law, to enter complete joy. So in our first reading, we hear Peter preaching about salvation through Jesus Christ to a group of Gentiles. The story begins as Peter arrives and preaches to the Gentiles in our scripture this morning. But after all, the incredible part about this is that it was against Jewish ritual for Judeans to associate with Gentiles. So why would he actually be there? Well, earlier in Acts 10, Peter is fixing some food. And while he is preparing it, he's going through the cleansing rituals. Peter during this time, falls into a trance, and he has a vision. Something like a large sheet is being lowered to the ground, and on it are all kinds of animals. Hooved animals, reptiles, birds, and a voice says to Peter, kill and eat. But Peter says, no way. I have never eaten anything that was unclean. And the voice replied, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. That happens not once, not twice, but three times. Then Peter is advised by the Spirit that three men will come to him, and he needs to follow what they say, or at least do what they they ask. Now enters Cornelius, a Roman centurion, who has heard about Jesus and God and wants to know more. He is a believer, but he's not Jewish. So Cornelius sends for Peter to hear more about Jesus. These were the three men the Spirit was referring to. In Acts 10, 27 through 29, we see this. And as he, Peter, talked with him, Cornelius, he went in and found that many had assembled. And he said to them, You yourselves know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate or to visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. So when I was sent for, for, so when I, was sent for I came without objection. Now may I ask why you sent for me? So, so in, in that piece of scripture, Peter denies the Jewish laws. And met with Cornelius. Peter sacrificed what he was taught, and he sacrificed what he believed to be what he believed to be right in order to follow where the Spirit was leading him. Cornelius explains as he was praying, a man in dazzling white appeared to him and told him to send for Peter in order to hear more about Jesus. Now we enter the reading we hear today. Peter begins to preach the good news and the story of Jesus, the foretelling of Scripture, Jesus' baptism, his crucifixion, God raising him on the third day. And as preachers do, he was going way too long. So the Spirit interrupts him. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of of the Holy Spirit have been poured out even on them, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. First, the Gentiles learned about Jesus and the joy of abiding in his love, following Jesus and his commandments to love one another. In response, they received gifts of understanding, speaking in tongues, and praising God. Second, There's also a learning on the side of Peter and the circumcised, or at least the rest of the Jewish or the the Jesus followers. They remember, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Then Peter said, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Peter realizes that the love of Jesus extends to everyone more than he believed or more than he was taught. The realization comes with some sacrifice of what Peter was brought up to believe. Imagine the thought of having one of your core beliefs challenged right before your eyes. Now, Peter had been raised and taught that the Messiah would come back to those who were Jewish, 
those who follow the law and rituals. Yet here, God's love through the Spirit was enlightening even the Gentiles. Peter's, Peter sacrificed what he was taught. He expands the rituals that he had been holding true for his life to follow Jesus' commandment of loving one another. He developed his understanding of loving one another because this is what he does next. So Peter ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited them to stay for several days. He said that they, the Gentiles, could be baptized. And they even invited them to stay for several days. Now, don't glance that over. Imagine if leaders of Antifa and the Cunanan groups were coming together in conversation about commonality and staying for several days. The joy of Christ is in us, and it is complete when we love one another by following Jesus' commandments, knowing that it will cost us something. Christ's joy will cost us something, not, not our lives, but Jesus has done that already and taken care of that through the greatest love. But in keeping Jesus' commandments, we will need to sacrifice. That sacrifice might be expanding a ritual or custom we have come to think of as unchangeable in our way of worship. Yet God is showing us, as the Spirit showed Peter, to abide in Christ and love one another. And for our joy to be complete, we need to look at God's love in a greater way. As you thought about your complete joy moments, when I asked you at the very beginning of the sermon, was there sacrificed was there sacrifice involved in experiencing that joy? For example, I shared with you about the children and the joy I experienced watching them do things that they loved. Sure, there was sacrifice. Missy and I sacrificed our, sacrificed our time, our, our money, our own desires, our own thoughts of how our children should spend their time to allow them to be who God was forming them to be. We spent time with our friends to listen and to be close to them in prayer to help them feel the love of God in the presence of others. We may not understand how individuals forgive others who inflict pain on them and their families, but the complete joy of God is shown in witnessing of such grace. There will always be some self-giving as we follow the commandments of Jesus to love one another. But in doing so, we dive into the promise of complete joy. The joy of Christ will be in us. As we, the church, are having a, a Peter visionary moment as we speak, there are two fronts of which we are being challenged through our religious rituals and customs. First, we are in this paradigm shift of what church will look like in the future. We are experiencing smaller and aging congregations, fewer pastors or people called to be pastors. More individuals are claiming to be spiritual but not religious. Smaller percentage of people claiming to be Christians than ever before. What does this mean? A good Lutheran would ask. It means we must love God and love one another. We are called to look at church in a new way. In God's love, we are forever changed and we are called to spread that love and good news. It means we might have to think in different ways as we are shown new ways of what God's inclusive love looks like and how it, ex it expands who we are and who we are called to love. Second, we are dealing with a pandemic which has forever changed the way we worship. We have cameras in our sanctuary and soon a couple of TV monitors. We have created a new paid position for our staff, the live stream production specialist. And people are questioning if coming back to worship in the actual church building is what they desire. What does that mean? 
It means that we must love God and love one another. We are called to look at church in a new way. In God's love, we are forever changed, and we are called to spread that love and good news. It means we might have to think in different ways as we are shown new ways of what God's inclusive love look, looks like and how we worship. Now, our church building will always be here. We will always need a place to gather for learning, for celebrations, and to su support each other in challenges and in grief. But maybe we could open it up to reimagining our church building for other purposes. For as we find out, or actually as we find our way through the threat of the pandemic, our Lutheran liturgy church, calendar, and festivals will always be here. We are Lutheran, and we need to keep our and maintain our identity. But maybe we need to expand some of the rituals and customs which hinder us from reaching others from the relevance of God's love, or at least educate others to explore God's acceptance and love through these rituals and customs that we hold so, so dearly. Jesus has made it clear to abide in his love, to be in his joy, that is complete. We need to do one thing. Keep his commandment. Love one another. And this is the exciting part. As the Spirit leads us, how that happens is totally up to us. If our rituals do that, then we use them. If our customs help others realize God loves them, we use them. Everything else how people choose to worship, what we sacrifice to share in that joy, how or who we share ministry with, that is totally up to us as we are led by the Spirit. Now, you might be thinking, I didn't sign up for this. Church is supposed to be the one thing that doesn't change in a changing world. I did not choose this, and you are right. We did not choose any of this. We did not wish for any of this to happen. A changing world, other people's changing views of the church, TVs, cameras. But God chose us. Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. We have been chosen and we are appointed by God to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Rituals have fallen away. Buildings have fallen down. The fruit that will last is love. By following Jesus' commandments, we will live into God's complete joy. Amen. Amen.